Okay. All right, everybody, we are live on Facebook and we are recording for Mythic Mission episode number 32. So welcome back, everybody. And uh, we're getting kind of spoiled this month. I'm going to have, let's see, three total episodes for the month of October. And I'm excited about today's because I have a good friend who's joined me on the show today and a fellow humanities professor. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest here in a second. But as I said, this is episode number 32 of Mythic Mission. And I'm borrowing from uh, Chesterton and Miguel here. Who, uh, who also has a podcast, and the uh, title of today's episode is Art is the Signature of Man, an interview with Professor Miguel Benitez, Jr. So let me go ahead and introduce my guest, and um, I'll, we'll just kind of jump right into our questions that we have today. Uh, Miguel Benitez, Jr. lives in Southwest Florida, where he's an instructor of humanities. He is also a PhD candidate in humanities at Faulkner University. Miguel's research focuses on G.K. Chesterton's philosophy of art and beauty, his goal is to point people to goodness, truth, and beauty, which is ultimately to point people to Jesus. And I'm happy to have him on the show. Thanks for coming on, Miguel. Thanks, Michael. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here with you today, and I appreciate the invite. Yeah, I'm I, you know, excited to talk about this topic because we just finished out in Intro to Humanities, our, art, our arts unit, uh, and we've moved into ethics, and we've got religion uh, towards the end of the semester. So yeah. it's kind of fresh. And I'm, as you know, as I've told you several times, I'm a new Chesterton reader. And we had uh, Joseph Pierce on several months ago. Yeah. And between the two of you, I'm just a sponge. So we've got lots of uh, great questions uh, today. And I know that you know what they are. So sure. I figured we'd just go ahead and get started. I always like to ask uh, guests about why they've chosen to be Christian, because a lot of people view religion as something that, you know, we choose. It's a private personal choice. And certainly there's an element to that, but we certainly have options and uh, people have lots of options today. I mean, there are just so many ways of looking at the world. So why did you become a Christian? What convinces you that it's the right way of looking at the world? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And as a listener of your program, I really appreciate that you you ask this question to all your guests you. um, because it's been interesting. Like so many times we're aware of the work they're currently doing, but we overlook the fact that there's a journey that somebody had to take to kind of end up where they're at. So I appreciate yeah. the question for Thank me. Um, why I'm a Christian today is very much a part of why I do what I'm doing every single day. Um, and, and there's really two major parts there. So I converted to Christianity at the age of 13. Um, basically, I was invited to church by a family member. My whole family went. We weren't regular church-going people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, depending who you ask, I think my mom would say she was a Christian at the time. My sister would say she was a Christian. But, you know, bottom line was we weren't regularly church going. I didn't even know what it would have meant to be a Christian at the time. And so mm -hmm. we were invited to a church, um, a rather large church in South Florida. Uh, the pastor at the end of his message uh, shares the, this idea that in, in order to be reconciled to God, we have to place our faith in Jesus, that Jesus is the way in which we can be reconciled with God. And, and quite frankly, it was just a message that kind of made sense to me. It was information that I just received. Um, I believed it. And I knew that I wanted to place my faith in Christ. I, I wanted to be reconciled to God. Um, and so I just did. And, and, and my, my family um, you know, converted to Christianity as well, started going to church regularly, it became an important part of our lives. Um, I'm going to fast forward for the sake of time here, but you fast forward eight years, I'm sitting as a sophomore in college, I was attending a community college at the time, I'm sitting in a course in which the professor is just regularly making attacks on Christianity, um, talking about, you know, the lack of evidence that Jesus was even a historical figure, uh, referred wow. to Christianity as a bunch of hocus pocus, uh, would oftentimes kind of mock um, 
Christian ideas. Um, he would, he would say, you know, things like I'm going to invent my own religion where everybody has to have at least one abortion. Right. So kind of saying, well, if one religion can claim that abortion is immoral, then another religion can claim that it's, it's moral and mandatory. Right. Yeah, so, yikes. um, just kind yikes. of really regularly, um, finding ways to poke holes into Christianity, but here's where it left me. I was sitting in this man's class one of the smartest people I had ever met in my life. And he believed that everything that I held dear, as far as my religious beliefs was just, you know, hocus pocus. It was, mm. it was, it was false. Uh, it was childish. It was something that ought to be rejected by anyone who's rational. Um, and so, you know, I begin taking these questions to others. I'm 21 at the time. Um, some of his objections are weightier to me than others. Um, and I'm just not finding a lot of good answers. Um, and I'm struggling. And, um, and so that for me was kind of the turning point where this faith that I had um, accepted as, as a teenager, a young teenager, now needed to have more substance to it if I was going to continue this journey. Um, the faith of my childhood, my teenage years was no longer going to be a mature enough faith, a robust enough faith, if I was going to continue in this journey. And so mm -hmm. that's where it left me. And, and, and I needed to figure out whether this stuff was, was real or not, because if it wasn't, I didn't want to keep, I could find other things to do on a Sunday morning. I could, I could uh, find different ways of living my life uh, mm -hmm. that, than than what Christianity prescribes, and right. so, um, so that, so that became just the the beginning of a major shift in the way that I thought about faith, the way that I thought about Christianity, and I can remember, um, and again, this this launched uh, numerous months of reading, mm -hmm. investigating, wrestling with these ideas, um, and I can remember kind of the night where, because I do think we all, in the midst of this investigation. There has to come a point where at some point you decide this is where the evidence takes me. This is where I'm landing. I can remember this would have been YouTube probably just started. So I didn't turn to YouTube. I think nowadays so many people would just wow. turn to YouTube with their questions and you get probably. all these videos. But for <laughs> me, this was right around 2006, which is when I think YouTube first launched. So I mm. didn't even think to turn there. Wow. Um, no, so instead no. of watching a debate, I'm reading the transcript of a debate uh, oh, right. between Bart Ehrman, professor oh. at University of North Carolina, and mm. William Lane Craig. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I remember that one. Christian philosopher. And they're debating the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I remember after all these months of reading of all these things, f just being floored by the fact that there was so much historical evidence that supports that Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, I was really genuinely blown away by that. Um, and, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that something like that, that is so central to the Christian faith, mm -hmm. had so much evidence for it. I, I mean, I really was blown away by it and was really wondering, why is this not a regular part of what we're hearing in church? Yeah. Um, because yeah. this is where our faith hinges. Either Jesus rose from the dead um, and Christianity is true, or he didn't. And, and Paul even puts it that way for mm -hmm. us in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, you know, either, either Jesus rose from the dead and, and our hope is found in him, or we should be pitied more than anybody else if we're believing this stuff and he didn't rise from the dead. So, so that right. was the night. I can remember the night. I can remember mm -hmm. sitting in my room. I'm reading through the transcript of the debate. And <laughs> I remember thinking, the evidence demands that I land in Christianity. The evidence demands that, that I put my trust, my eternal trust in Jesus. And so, um, so that's where I landed. And that was kind of what shifted everything for me. Um, and ironically, you know, um, the Lord saw fit to now have me be a college professor in a very mm -hmm. similar kind of institution where I had this crisis of faith, mm. um, you know, just 14 years ago. Um, yeah. And so now I'm teaching um, in a similar context. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it's really neat. Um, and I think it's been um, just 
one of God's graces in my life that I've been able to now land at a similar kind of institution, teaching students who are in similar instances and situations of life as I was uh, in, in, in that situation, which just really kind of shaped who I am today. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that, that's an amazing story. And you've come full circle. And, and now that you're in a position as an educator, I'm sure knowing you, that you would never uh, speak pejoratively of somebody else's beliefs, but entertain it and listen and help them work through it because right. the ad hominem attacks and, and emotional you know, um, polemic, you know, is not, not an argument and it's, it's, uh, not the way to approach, I think, you know, as an educator, listening to what people hold dear. And so I'm, I'm sure you're kind of paying it forward and making sure that you you're engaging, uh, in the marketplace of ideas with your students. I have no doubt. Uh, and it's uh, really great too that, you know, you mentioned evidence and I'll just kind of say briefly before we move on to the main questions. Thank you again for sharing your experience. I think it's important that we share experience because we can get stuck in the realm of the abstract as Christians sometimes and, and forget that God transforms our lives on a daily basis. Um, a lot of people would be surprised at what you said about evidence of the resurrection because we're, we're used to thinking, and this applies to the arts, so it's a great segue, we're used to thinking that you can't speak of evidence for something supernatural because, well, reason and science and, you know, how can we prove that empirically? How can science, how can the sciences, natural, social, anything, prove that somebody rose from the dead? And I'm sure that's going to be alarming to a lot of people, but you know, a, lo a lot of things can be counted as evidence. But I think the interesting thing is that most people, when they say that, don't realize that they've already entered into this conversation with the assumption that the supernatural is not real and that we can trust everything that our senses tell us and everything that science tells us or sci scientists. Uh, and that's, that's not accurate. So just food for thought for anybody out there thinking, I mean, there is um, a lot of evidence for the risen Jesus and a lot of evidence for Christianity as a historical religion. It's not just a myth, you know, it is rooted in history. Um, and so uh, maybe we'll have you on the show again another time to talk about that since it was so formative in your, uh, your Christian walk. So yeah, moving sure, on, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be a great topic. Um, People approach the arts and beauty, the, you know, in the business, we call it aesthetics, the philosophical discussion or contemplation of, of beauty in the arts. Uh, and they approach it with that very well-known slogan, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We hear this from our students all the time, and maybe we hear it in different, different forms, but it's, it's distilled, and that, that's basically the bottom line. There's a kernel of truth to this. I think I'd like, you know, maybe you to unpack that a little bit. Um, but we also know that it's, it's not right. And so could you, could you take that on for us? You know, I mean, is that true? Is beauty just in the eye of the beholder? Is it up to us to determine alone what is beautiful? Is there more yeah, truth than that? So I certainly appreciate the question. It's something I think about a lot. Um, it, I think the challenge is that it's, it's an idea that is so deeply embedded in our culture that um, to even question it, um, it, it just seems like it's it's an absurd idea. Um, the, the people who oftentimes are more likely to question it um, are either people who have had very deep experiences in the arts that would mm -hmm. suggest to them, no, something more is happening here, or people who have thought um, for a long time and much more carefully about their entire worldview and some of the implications of accepting some of these ideas. Uh, mm. I didn't. I had never even heard this idea that beauty might be something more than just a subjective preference um, until I was in grad school. Mm. I was in a class with uh, Dr. John Mark Reynolds. He used to be a professor at Biola. He's now running the St. Constantine School in mm. Houston, Texas. Um, cool. And um, and so he makes this claim that beauty is objective. And I was blown away. I, I found the claim to be it, um, just almost scandalous. Like, how, how do you make such a claim? And he mm -hmm. actually argues that as a, as a society, as the society begins to break down, the first thing they reject is objective beauty, then objective morality, and then objective truth. Cool. So many times... You go to an apologetics conference or some kind of Christian philosophy conference, 
and you'll have objective truth or objective uh, morality defended. You'll have objective truth defended. But he suggested that we're already starting behind the eight ball when we just assume that beauty is subjective. And wow. so, um, hmm. and so that that was that kind of piqued my interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it wasn't it wasn't the only topic of the course, so we didn't spend a ton of time on it. But it really got me thinking. And so, yeah, I think that this idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder um, has too many assumptions kind of worked into it by what people mean by that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so one of the things is I think we confuse the claim of something being beautiful with our own personal tastes, right? And so I think it's important to keep those two things distinct. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we all do have different tastes and, that, and that's okay. Um, but keep in mind that we're talking about two different things when we're talking about uh, whether or not something is, you know, um, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that's important. Um, and then the other thing that I also think is just kind of assumed is, well, people disagree about what is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we can't really know. And, and that's something that I regularly try and address in my humanities courses, not just about beauty, but that assumption that I see come up over and over again um, at my institution, I also get to teach ethics courses. Mm. And this comes, this objection comes up all the time. Yep. For some reason, many in our society, including Christians, by the way, um, have come to the conclusion that if there is serious disagreement about a subject, we can't possibly know what's true or it's a subjective matter. Like it's mm. just a matter of opinion because yeah. there are multiple opinions. That's all we have is opinions. Um, and, and I try to push back hard against this kind of subjectivism and skepticism because that's ultimately what it's rooted in, this idea that we can't know. Um, and and so, so I think that those assumptions are kind of smuggled in when mm. people say, you know, beauty is just in the eyes of the beholder. Um, now, well yes, much of beauty um, is uh, perceived through our senses, uh, through mm -hmm. our, our eyes, right? And so in that sense, right, where we are perceiving beauty um, yeah. through, the, through vision, right, through our, mm -hmm. our, our sight, um, but, but certainly it's not limited to that. And mm -hmm. so so then, of course, kind of naturally what comes is, well, then how, how can you prove that beauty is objective, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm very hesitant. I know other people are much more comfortable with this. I'm very hesitant to say that we can't prove something. I, I, I think we might be capable of proving things that we're not immediately aware of. And so, so, so I'm, I'm leaving room for the door that we might be able to prove that. I'm just mm -hmm. saying I personally... Um, have not come across an argument that I think proves this, but I do think we have good reasons for thinking that beauty is objective. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll just briefly give us um, two reasons why I, I think that we, we at least have reason to question whether beauty is subjective, which is kind of the working assumption of our culture, right. and, and possibly even more than that in saying, well, actually, I lean more towards this idea that beauty is objective. Um, so the first is this kind of very strong intuition that we as human beings get. And, and I think this transcends culture, it transcends time, it transcends gender, it transcends all these things, however we would kind of want to divide up society. Mm -hmm. um, I think it transcends it. So the example, and this actually goes back all the way to um, John Mark Reynolds in the course, he gave this example, and it always kind of stayed with me. So if I'm holding in one hand a red rose, mm -hmm. and in the other hand, I'm holding a dead rat carcass being eaten by maggots, right? And I show you both of them, and I say, which is more beautiful, right? I mean, across cultures, across time, mm. the overwhelming majority of people are going to say the rose. Now, mm. majority does not determine truth, but mm. we have to ask ourselves, why is it that across times, across culture, across gender, across age, across all these things, people are going to say that the rose is more beautiful. Mm. And on the flip side of that, 
if somebody says that now they may find the rat being eaten by maggots more interesting, right? They may find right. it fascinating. They may be intrigued by it. I mean, I could see how maybe even scientists are like fascinated by the way in which all that stuff works. That's mm. fine. Right. But we're not confusing that for beauty. Mm. And so, and, and I would suggest that if someone were to say, no, I genuinely believe that the rat eaten, being eaten by maggots is more beautiful. Mm. I do believe that we would see that as that person is missing something about reality. Mm. They're actually mistaken about mm -hmm. reality. Um, and we have this impulse. Um, Augustine talks about, you know, when, when somebody sees their favorite actor and they say, this is, you know, the greatest actor. And somebody jumps in and says, no, 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 that's not the greatest actor. Well, if all of it was subjective, right? If mm -hmm. movies, you know, were just a matter of subjective taste, mm -hmm. why do we even bother debating those things, right? Exactly. I think our impulse to debate it suggests to us that um, there's something more there. So I've got one more example, but I'll pause just in case there's anything. Yeah, no, no. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm comforted to know that my own thinking in my own classes is being echoed here. I, I approach it in a similar manner. I mean, everything you've said it makes it clicks. It makes sense. Um, I'm reminded of mere Christianity because we were talking ethics this week and uh, about the Tao and the abolition of man with my students. And, you know, Lewis says in mere Christianity, when, you know, two people disagree about something, why is it that they argue? And it, it made me think of that just as we do in ethics with aesthetics. we think that the, the argument uh, means that, you know, we have different standards of beauty, but actually it, assumes a common standard that we are arguing over because one, let's say A, conforms more to this standard we'll call C than B does. And both have knowledge of C, the tertium quid, as he calls it elsewhere, you know, the third thing. Um, and yet, if we were to say it's all subjective, then all they could do is fight and coerce violently, rhetorically or otherwise that, you know, they're, they're, the meaning of beautiful would be lost, the meaning of good. Uh, and as you just kind of hinted too, we wouldn't have film critics or um, bloggers or people, or even like evaluating, you know, in the culinary arts, food. I mean, you know, ask people, have they ever wasted their time on Netflix? And I'm sure they'll say, uh-huh. You know, is there ever, has there ever been a bad film? I'm thinking Tommy was so, you know, uh, yeah. The Room or something like uh, most people would agree. So I think it all uh, clicks and I think most people will probably, this will resonate with what most people believe. So yeah, go on, give us the second reason because I'm interested. Yeah, so, so just to, to add to what you were saying there, and in these debates that we have with people, we, hmm. we do believe we're talking about the object in question. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, I feel this, you feel that, and so let's debate about our feelings, right? But, but we're actually pointing to the object. We're pointing to something outside of ourselves yes. and saying, no, you've misunderstood this. You've, you've failed to appreciate all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. again, not a proof, mm -hmm. but it seems that the way in which we live makes more sense um, if there is something, a kind of characteristic about that object that mm -hmm. either makes it beautiful or less beautiful. Yeah. So that would be one. Yeah. Um, so a second example, and again, uh, at least for me, this made a lot of sense. Um, yeah. We look at all these various different modes of art or mediums of art. Um, you think of, for example, um, a painting, a song, um, like a piece of music, poetry, literature, people, mm -hmm. animals, right? So now we're even beyond art, right? Um, nature. And you look at all these things and it's like, okay, they really seem completely unconnected. Mm -hmm. um, they, they don't seem to relate to one another. Mm -hmm. And yet we call all these various different things beautiful. And so the question is like, why is it that all these things that seem to have no relation at all, still we, we refer to them as beautiful? Mm -hmm.
And it doesn't, it doesn't seem obvious uh, mm-hmm. as to what that is. And yet we, we describe them as beautiful. I mean, we're talking about things that we observe with our eyes versus yeah. things that we listen to versus things that we just think about. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and yet there's this connecting uh, quality to all of them, despite them being so different. And I want to suggest that at least mm-hmm. one of the qualities that connect these unrelated things mm-hmm. is actually beauty. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I think because we're talking about value, I agree that this goes right into ethics too, that the shared source is that what Lewis uses the Chinese concept for the Tao, but what might be the Dhamma in Buddhism or you know, uh, hokma and Hebrew, the, the idea of wisdom, of a, a, a tapestry, uh, you know, of a moral law and beauty woven into the universe, and that we can kind of look at the the weave, you know, the greater weave. We can we can discern the, those qualities, and that's it, amazing. And it's amazing that you know, while there are so many shifting and various perspectives, our tastes uh, or our perceptions of beauty and goodness can change according to this standard, right? We, we could, as you, you said earlier, this person might be missing something about knowing reality. They can improve their knowledge and maybe they can't see what's beautiful in a work of art or in a person even because they're not trained or they haven't, there's, there's a, a je ne sais quoi, right? There's something missing that needs to be fit into place until they can perceive that which is already there. Yeah, so. that's excellent. And, th- and that's right. And, and I do want to make that point, because certainly anyone who's listening to this, especially if this is new to them, there's mm. all kinds of objections coming to their mind as to why what I've presented is not sufficient. And it's not right. I've, I've just kind of presented some ideas to begin thinking about to at least question this assumption mm-hmm. that beauty is merely in the eye of the beholder. Sure. Right? So sure. so that's what, all I'm trying to do. But but I also want to say we have also really good reasons to think about why it is that we have aesthetic disagreement, mm. even if it's not subjective. So, mm-hmm. so I think you've given one is, is ignorance. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, just not being, so there's certain forms of art that I just know very, very little about. For exactly. example, music, music mm-hmm. is an area that I just know so little about yep. that. I, I'm not the person who can tell you this piece is more beautiful. I think there's obvious, right? Like there's sure. obvious distinctions, but when we get into the more, nitty gritty of, of really important works. I'm not the person who can kind of uh, tell you, you know, which is more beautiful than the mm-hmm. other. Um, but also, <laughs> also, I think um, overexposure, mm. right? Um, oh, yeah. so, so in some sense, uh, and Chesterton huh. says this, that in some sense, like the first time we see a work of art is the, the truth, Right. Mm. It's like the time that we see that work of art, because Mm. the rest of the time, how we approach it, how we think about it, how we experience it is also shaped by the other experiences. Right. Mm. And so 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 I think overexposure. um, So, for example, uh, we oftentimes visit friends uh, in Tennessee during the winter. Mm -hmm. And so we're driving in Tennessee and you see all these beautiful mountains, you know, as you as you're driving and I'm just thinking, this is beautiful. And it's amazing that just a drive to the store, you're looking at these beautiful mountains. Um, and yet, I'm willing to bet that if we lived there, mm. it wouldn't hit me every day. Um, I, I wouldn't appreciate the beauty of the landscape every yeah. day because yeah. I get used to it. It doesn't make the landscape any less beautiful. Right. I'm just used to it. And so right. I think that we have good reasons for why we come to this aesthetic disagreement, either ignorance or wow. overexposure. And, and, and those help us understand why there's disagreement, even if there really is this quality of beauty that is objective. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, I, I didn't think of the overexposure point. That was actually a revelation for me to believe it or not, to, to think about it. I mean, I it really yeah. had overlooked that. So thank you. Um, almost like a, a way of taking it for granted, but as you said, it's still there. So let's, let's move into talking about the, the subject of your, you know, PhD research and, uh, you know, part of your passion and uh, that's GK Chesterton, you know, briefly who he was, when he was, uh, and then talk, start talk, telling us about his philosophy uh, or his views rather on art and beauty aesthetics. And, uh, and I'll, I'll weave in a couple of other questions, as you know, I'm interested in what he meant by art as the signature of man, but let's start there with the basics. 
Yeah, very good. So um, G.K. Chesterton uh, was, um, so he was born in the late 1800s. Uh, he writes from the early 1900s to about the mid 1930s. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's writing in, in the uh, 20th century, um, early 20th century. He's um, in England um, and a prolific writer. Um, he, he was a journalist. So, um, so we have so many writings by Chesterton. Um, if you, if you uh, look at his collections, his collected works, I mean, there's just so many, because he was a journalist, he was writing all the time. And so, so that's one of the neat things about studying Chesterton is there's just so much to look at. And he's weaving his ideas throughout all of his things. And, and his titles are oftentimes just so misleading, like you're reading a, 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 a journal, or I'm sorry, a, you know, a, a editorial that he did, and and you're thinking, yeah, this isn't going to be relevant to my research. And then he makes this throwaway line that's completely relevant to what you were looking for. So it's just very interesting to read him. Mm. Um, and uh, and so yeah, he wrote numerous works. Uh, he's also known for uh, writing his detective stories, the Father Brown uh, mm -hmm. stories, in which you have this priest. Uh, that solves mysteries. Um, and so a kind of Sherlock Holmes character, though very different in personality, yeah. but, but um, yeah, so he, he's solving uh, murders, solving, um, you know, uh, various uh, crimes. Um, and, and this is what I love. Uh, why, right? Why a mm. priest to solve crimes? Mm. Well, for Chesterton, who better than a priest would understand human nature, right? And so um, it's our understanding of human nature that helps Father Brown unlock the keys to the various ministries that he's trying to solve. And yeah. I think that reveals a lot to us about Chesterton. Mm -hmm. For Chesterton, exploring humanity unlocks um, so much of what is real to us. Mm -hmm. And and so... So, for example, his, 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 the, my favorite work of Chesterton's, and I would say I'm probably in the minority here when, when talking about this, but is The Everlasting Man. And so yeah. much of that particular work is about human nature, what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is where he uses that phrase that art is the signature of man. Okay. Um, and, and so I, I think that Chesterton's, kind of gift to us is the way in which he was able to reflect upon humanity um, and see us for what we are. Mm -hmm. um, he saw, he saw the great romance in our humanity, but also the great tragedy in our mm -hmm. humanity. And, and he recognized that and, and he was making a push. And I think this will be relevant to your listeners because it's so much of the work that you've done his major push was for a re-enchantment mm -hmm. of, of the world that we find ourselves in. That mm -hmm. if we were being fully human, right? If we're flourishing as human beings, we would recognize the beauty, the enchantment that is embedded mm -hmm. into the world that we live in. Yeah. Um, and so those, those are just some of the things that I just really appreciate about wow. Yeah. And, and you mentioned you're in the minority. Is it that the everlasting man is not everybody's uh, go to? Is it orthodoxy or? Yeah. It, so uh, I would say orthodoxy is, is, is the one that most people okay. uh, turn to or see as kind of his his greater work. And we're mm -hmm. talking in particular about about his works of apologetics. So sure. it's kind of okay. a, a trilogy he wrote um heretics the everlasting man and, and orthodoxy and, ah. and so all three are great and i yeah. i commend them to you and to your to your listeners um but that's where he really kind of lays out most of his philosophy and they really are works of apologetics um mm -hmm. i don't i don't know if he himself would have called them that um he, okay. he was not necessarily like a huge fan of apologetics works. Mm. He, he talks about how he de didn't really read much apologetics, um, but nevertheless, they are his defense of the faith. And mm. so, um, yeah, so I, I think I, and, and not, I mean, people appreciate the everlasting man, but I think, I think more people appreciate orthodoxy. It, it contains some of his more famous chapters and things ah, like that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Okay. So um, would you say, 
even though he may not have considered it this uh, his angle in apologetics, but was aesthetics proportionately what he focused on more as far as uh, drawing people to Christ? Would you say that was a theme of his his writings? So I think it's one of them. Yeah. Okay. And it's what I'm trying to unpack in my in my dissertation. Tell us more um, about so, that. Yeah. yeah. So so I think uh, very briefly, a few things that he's regularly fighting against. And I think it's because of the time in which he's writing the people mm -hmm. who are popular in his day. Um, mm -hmm. He he is um, writing against materialism. So the idea that the physical world is all that exists. Mm -hmm. um, he's writing against uh, moral relativism. Um, and then he's he is writing against a, a world of aesthetics that for him has been shaped by the other two things, mm -hmm. materialism and moral relativism. And okay. so, so those three, three ideas come up over and over again in his writings. It's, it's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. He never wrote a single work. And this is part of what makes it challenging, but also exciting. He never mm -hmm. wrote a single work of his philosophy of art. Um, mm -hmm. You probably get the closest to that in The Everlasting Man, but even then, none of it's completely dedicated to art. Interesting, um, okay. And so, and so it's trying to piece together some of his ideas as to what he was really getting at and what yeah. he was thinking. So, so he uses this phrase, the signature of man, to yeah, describe, to, to define art, right? Okay. He, he uses it to define art. And what I appreciate and what I think Chesterton understood, um, and, and I'm hoping that a lot of my research and much of my career can maybe be kind of shaped by this, is that as a society, when we lost our understanding of what it meant to be human, we lost our understanding of what art is because mm -hmm. art is connected to human nature. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean for art to be the signature of man? Well, in its most basic sense, what is a signature? A signature is an identifier, right? Mm -hmm. When you sign a piece of paper, it's to let someone know that you, right? That's your identification. You have approved of this. You have given. So what he's saying is when we see art, it's an indication that humans have been present, right? That mm -hmm. humans have, have, have communicated, have, have given something. And so, so when we think about the various things, and mm -hmm. you know this as a, as a professor of humanities, anytime the question, what does it mean to be human comes up? There's a hundred different answers that come up, but, but let's boil it down to the ones that seem to come up over and over again. I would say mm -hmm. even in secular literature. Mm -hmm. um, so um, moral beings, right? We're, we're, we're beings that um, seem to ra reason morally. Um, so for example, even, even people who are, um, you know, against, you know, the, the killing of animals or anything like that. No one's out there trying to arrest the lion for murdering the zebra, right? <laughs> we, we just, we, you just don't see that. Um, because we know there's something different about the way that they live, the way that they, they function mm -hmm. than the way that we as humans do. So sure. morality, um, reasoning, I've already brought that up, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're rational creatures in a way that the other animals are not. So that mm -hmm. comes up. We're religious beings right mm -hmm. homo religiosus is what some have called us right so mm -hmm. so we're religious beings um so we we're we are uh, i remember so in undergrad i took a lot of anthropology courses mm -hmm. the answer in much of the anthropology literature was actually language the way that we communicate is just distinct say, from yeah. the other animals all right so let's just look at those four things moral mm -hmm. rational religious and um you know, communicative or, or, um, linguistic. Yeah. Linguistic. Yeah. Right. So, so we look at those four things and it's like, okay, yeah. Art is moral, religious, rational, and communicates. Mm. Right. So, so I think that's what Chesterton was holding to now, interestingly enough, in more contemporary kind of philosophies of art, these various things kind of get denied in different ways. Mm. But if we just kind of think about what we would typically think of as art, mm -hmm. um, we'll find that there are those elements within art. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so when we oftentimes 
say so i'll oftentimes hear things like well anything is art right anything yeah, is art time. anything can be art um mm. a couple things um i know i understand the inclination i understand why we might be tempted to think along those lines mm -hmm. i would say one do a thought experiment right so the thought experiment could be you're walking into a house that you've never walked into before and i want you to just walk through that house and, and imagine yourself taking all of the art out of that house and putting it on the front, on the front lawn. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's tempted to take a dining room chair and put it out on the lawn or take the utensils in the kitchen and put it out on the lawn. Why? <laughs> because we kind of know, even, even if we can't provide this very precise, uh, tight-knit definition of art, yeah. Um, intuitively we know what things are art and what things are not art. Yeah. Um, so, so that's one thing that I would say, but also, um, I, I would say if we think about art, it makes sense for it to be tied to human qualities mm. because only humans do art. Um, right. so, so, you know, we can look at beautiful things that are made by animals, spiders, webs, uh, mm. beavers dams birds nests um, you know beehives we, we can go on and on about different things that animals do mm. that we might be tempted to classify as art mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting um, there's this mm. there's this line in the communist manifesto of all places right so here you have the son of of two cuban uh, immigrants quoting mm. Karl marx in a positive light yeah. right so but <laughs> Uh, but it's really helpful <laughs> as he's talking about the fact that sometimes bees are better builders than humans, right? Like, mm. so he's granting all of that. He's like, but what makes the human thing art and, and the animal thing not art? Well, right. that humans first erect it in the imagination and then make it concrete, right? Oh. So there's this, there's this act of the imagination and mm -hmm. then uh, a, a, a making it into a concrete form of some kind. Um, and so that is a human thing, not a rest of the animals thing. And, and, so, and so it would make sense then that, that art is characterized and shaped by our uniquely human qualities. Mm -hmm. um, and so that then gives us a way in which we can begin to think about art, criticize art, explore art, produce art, right? Mm. It's, it's the things that are deeply human that, that make art what it is. Yeah, that, that gets me thinking. Um, and I know you joked one time and I, I can see the, how, how much Lewis <laughs> really hijacked some of Chesterton's ideas, maybe yes. it seems like yeah. a, a, quite a bit. Yeah. Um, not to, of course, to deny he had any original ideas. Oh, but, of course. Uh, right. That there's quite a bit, but I'm thinking about um, a line. I can't remember where it is. Where he says, Lewis says, "The real world is where our imagination is. The bank our imagination draws its checks from." You know, and it, it just your application of imagination there that has to do with intentionality and arranging something in the in the mind to have a certain meaning, and then executing it concretely and I, I just made me think of that and it's um it's that one missing piece i'm sure we could cite others but that's a very critical piece that you know chimpanzees and bees and that's right and others just don't have that's right uh, and yeah. yet we can remark on things that animals make having an intrinsic beauty which points to the great artist you know so I, I can see that's a very clear answer. And, uh, and I appreciate how careful you've been in saying, oh, this is proof. You know, I'm careful like that too. When I tell my students, I'm thinking, you know, you probably leave here with more questions and answers about these sure. things. But I like that you've routinely said and consistently said that we need to, um, to you know, question these things that we inherit from culture and, and these, you know, sound bites we get all the time. Uh, and this, this just has been very uh insightful so yeah, and briefly let yeah, me just add ahead. one one thing here because sure. part of the struggle in persuading people of this is that there's yeah. a lot of common ground that has to be built before mm -hmm. we can get here right so aesthetics is kind of downstream 
from metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. So, Agreed. so that's where it, it can be difficult. If if we don't already agree on some of those building blocks, yeah, it's going to be difficult for me to persuade you about these things over here. Yeah. Although I still think Makes it's sense. it's a worthwhile endeavor. But let me very briefly just sketch sure. at least a theological argument because I think some Christians may also kind of object to some of what I've said today. And mm. this I think is a, a powerful reason. To kind of say, no, yeah, art does have this connection to our human, um, unique human qualities. That's what I wanted um, to ask you about, actually. Yeah. How is art religious? So, yeah. yeah. So, so in Genesis 1, right, we're told that male and female are made in the image of God, right? Mm. And so theologians throughout the ages have argued about what that means. Um, and I'm more of a kind of all-encompassing guy like I like all of those ideas so mm. let's throw them all into the into the equation here mm -hmm. I don't I don't know that it's one single thing you know is it that we are like rulers on earth the way that mm. God is a ruler over all things mm -hmm. is it so is it a positional thing is right. it that we're rational and moral beings the way that God is a rational and moral being and I'm saying yes right I'm saying mm. all of it all I think above. that's all all good right mm -hmm. but here's one thing that I got from Philip Riken um, that, that to me, I'm sorry, it's Leland Riken. I'm confusing oh, okay. father and son. So Leland yeah. Riken, um, he makes this argument and I, I think there's a lot of weight here. Yeah. So, so he says, okay, yes, but let's say that you're approaching Genesis one for the first time, reading it with fresh eyes. Mm. You read in Genesis chapter one, towards the end of the chapter that male and female are made in God's image. Okay. Well, what is God like? Again, all you have is Genesis 1. You're reading it for the first time. What do we know God has done? God has created. Mm. So, right, minimally, it seems, we would want to say to be made in the image of God is to be creative. Mm. Um, and so, so, yes, I think part of our being image bearers is what we do when we produce the arts. Yeah. Um, and so the arts are a reflection of God now, and Chesterton's very careful to do this. Tolkien is very careful to do this. Mm. Okay, when what we are doing when we create and when we make art, yes, we're reflecting God's image, yeah. but we are combining. We mm -hmm. are not creating ex nihilo out of no. nothing, no. right? So, so ours is a it pales in comparison. It is it is only analogous to mm. what God is doing, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, reflective of what God is doing. And yes. so, so, so I think that gives us even further reason to say, okay, yeah, when we're being creative, mm. when we're making art, we are pulling on our unique human qualities because mm. we are the beings that are made in God's image. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so another reason to think that what we, when, when we're doing art, there's something uniquely human happening here. I love it. I love it. Uh, this is kind of related, but it, it gets me thinking, you know, I don't want to go down this road, but who created God? But there's another thing that comes up. It goes back to Freud and, you know, the civilization and its discontents, the famous, you know, wish fulfillment argument about, well, what if, what if God is made in our image? What if we created God? Yes. So I, I think to me, the way I would start to answer this, I don't know if you have any ruminations on this, but is that, well, where are we getting our blueprint from? Where is the standard of, of how we're fashioning this, this person called God? And it seems to me that sometimes people who raise the argument don't consider that we would still have to fashion God out of something from which we're, you know, we're making him. He's made of something, some kind of cosmic blueprint or platonic form or objective idea or, you know, standard of beauty, you know, my next question was about objections and I want to talk a little bit if we can about that. Um, I still want to ask you one more thing about Chesterton and art for art's sake, that essay that you wrote, which I'd love for people to go over to your website and read, but just on that objection, I mean, do you have any thoughts there? Um, yeah. So we, we actually cover a little bit of uh, Freud's um, religious ideas or ideas oh. about religion in my humanities courses. Oh, very and cool. so, um, so I think a couple things, um, that we need to remember. Um, one is why we come to believe something is zero indication of whether that thing is true or not, mm. right? So, so hmm. there are things that 
my son and daughter believe that are true. If you ask them, why do you believe it? It's because daddy told me or mommy told me. Now, daddy told me, mommy told me works for them right now. It's a functional, it's a, it's a very pragmatic way of determining truth for them because they know it keeps them safe, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, me telling my son something is not a great reason for him to believe that it's true, ultimately speaking, right? Mm -hmm. As an adult, he's going to need more reasons than that. Yeah. It, just because he came to believe it, though, doesn't mean that it's false, even though his reason for believing it is not ultimately sufficient for mm. why he believes it. Okay, so good. this idea of wish fulfillment, maybe some of us did come to our religious beliefs out of a sense of wish fulfillment. It says nothing about whether or not those beliefs are true. So how <laughs> somebody comes to believe yeah. something is irrelevant as to whether or not it's true. Is that the genetic that, fallacy, Miguel? Yeah, it is to commit the genetic fallacy. Oh, okay, yeah. all right, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so, tracking with you. All right. So, so I, I think, I think that that's wow. that's one problem. Um, the other problem um, that that happens with Freud in particular, mm -hmm. Feuerbach, and maybe some of these others that make similar arguments, right. is okay. But do you apply it to your own religious ideas? Right. Is is atheism a wish fulfillment for you? Right. So uh, so we know that Freud had a really bad relationship with his father. Mm -hmm. And we know uh, Paul Witz, for example, is a psychologist um, who came out with a book called The Faith of the Fatherless, where he mm -hmm. shows that the 20th century's biggest atheists all had very troubled relationships with their father or a key male figure in their life. Um, and so, okay, so, so maybe I'm making certain, uh, projections, um, about what I think I need in this mm -hmm. life. And maybe my relationship with my father has influenced those projections that I've made. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now Freud is making projections. His father was bad. He'd rather his father be absent. So he's making this projection into atheism he rejects his father he rejects mm. god okay right. let's just say that we've both done that yeah. okay what are we left with now the question is what is true that's the question i'm interested in not mm. why i've shaped certain ideas the way that i've shaped them. those are interesting questions but they yeah. don't tell us those are subjective questions right yeah. why do i feel a certain way towards god or right. feel a certain way uh, about the idea of God, right? Mm. And those are all important and probably helpful for us to explore, but sure. they say nothing about wow. whether or not God actually exists and and what, if God does exist, what God is like. It, it doesn't speak to that at all. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I think that's going to be very helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. So I hope uh, people can listen to this again. I, I got to go back and take notes, Professor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, good stuff. Uh, it made me think too a little bit about um, uh, not only Plato, but uh, the not the last battle, the silver chair, a bit as I was ruminating on it That's earlier right. in the semester. So, how uh, profound! Very good. Okay, um, to to tie up because we've kind of answered some of the other questions. We've talked about how you know art can be religious, can point to God as a uh, thing we've we've covered. We've talked about some objections. That was really great. Um, you've written an essay, and if you tell us a little bit about it, and it has to do with art for art's sake and why this is problematic, if I understood correctly, what does that exactly mean, and and why is it problematic, and what did Chesterton kind of argue instead? Yeah. So briefly, art for art's sake is this movement that occurs um, in in the eighteen hundreds. Um, and, and it certainly would have been in the air for Chesterton uh, during the time he was writing. Okay. And art for art's sake is really kind of grounded on two major pillars, right? One is the attempt to argue, keep in mind, this is all happening during the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So people are dealing with the fact that they everything has been reduced to pragmatism. Like, mm -hmm. is it practical? Is it efficient? Is it, is it helpful? Is it productive? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so a lot of artists and poets and things like that, they're, they're, they're starting to wrestle with these ideas of like, where's the value in what I provide to society 
um, in a world that only values these pragmatic things, right? And so, wow. so that's what they're wrestling with. So yeah. one pillar of the art for art's sake movement is, okay, art has its own value. Art is, is, is um, important in and of itself. Okay. And art um, has this intrinsic value. It doesn't have to be useful to be really meaningful. Okay, so okay. so that's one branch, right? right? The second branch is that art must only be judged from within the world of aesthetics, which mm. means you are not permitted to bring in a judgment from outside of that world of aesthetics. Okay, okay so so what that ends up doing is it cuts off any moral judgments oh. about art. Right. Huh. So those are the two branches. OK, wow. What what I want to suggest and Chesterton certainly would have said the same thing. That first branch. Yes. OK. Art is meaningful, is mm -hmm. important, even if it's not useful. Right. Okay? Yeah. But even that needs some tweaking because okay. the idea is that art is an end to itself. Right. Right. And Chesterton, I think if he would have been asked this, he doesn't say, state this explicitly, but I'm confident in saying he would take issue with it. And I do too, mm -hmm. because as human beings that are image bearers, nothing that we do is an end to itself. It should be an end to the glory of God, right? Mm -hmm. So everything that we do should actually be for some other end, mm -hmm. Um, and it is to ultimately glorify God in what we're doing as human beings. Right. And so, so, so in that, as long as we keep that in mind, then yes, there's a sense in which I can talk about art being valuable in itself intrinsically. Sure. Right. So, so I'm okay with that kind of language, as long as we keep that in mind, mm -hmm. because we also have to, we can't, we have to be careful not to make art idolatrous. Right? right. Because if it becomes an end in itself, then that's what we're doing is we're falling into idolatry. That's right. Um, yeah. So so that would be one thing that we want to be careful of, though. That's not the the most problematic issue. The other the, the other pillar is the problem where we're cutting off moral judgments about art. Mm. So the art for art's sake movement wants to say aesthetic merit or, you know, whether something is good art uh, is completely divorced from whether or not something is moral hmm. um and and so um this is something that this debate is raging on today there's various views about the relationship between art and morality that i don't have the time to get into hmm. um though i've discussed some of them with guests on my podcast so mm -hmm. um your, your guests can certainly check that out mm -hmm. um so i won't get into that the only thing that i will say is again when we understand that art is rooted in human nature, then we recognize that art cannot be divorced from morality because humanity cannot be divorced from, from morality. Yeah, exactly. And I think that we know this. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, if, if a film right, is produced, and, and there are films like this that oftentimes get brought up as examples, mm -hmm. if a film is produced and all the lighting and the scenes and, you know, all the, the camera work, you know, all of it is very good and technically sound and it has everything you could want in that aspect. But mm -hmm. the overall message of the film is a racist message. Mm -hmm. It seems odd that we would say that that doesn't affect the way in which we view the film yeah. or that we can that we can appreciate the film as a work of art and that appreciation not be affected in any way yeah. by our mor moral instincts right so right so i i think i think that this ends up being absurd um so so chesterton for example says that um, art for art's sake is like amputation for amputation's sake like <laughs> i'm just cutting off my arm for no reason at all right <laughs> like that's what we're doing we're cutting off morality from art mm -hmm. uh, for no good reason at all wow. and so and so he pushes back really hard on this and again if it, we have to make the argument for art being connected to human uh, hu human nature, if we get there, then it's easy to see why morality matters. Yeah. However, 
I do want to make a quick point that I think is relevant, especially to the Christians that I think we overlook oftentimes. Please. Morality is an important part of our aesthetic judgments. Mm. But that's not the only part of our aesthetic judgment. Mm -hmm. So when you get these Christian films that oftentimes have a good message, they're communicating the moral message that doesn't make them good art. Because if they failed to use the medium of the art, so for example, if a film preaches to you, that's not what a film is supposed to be, it's still bad art, even though it has a good message. Because our aesthetic judgment needs to be taken on the whole. And that's what I'm saying. So this, and maybe this is a bit more controversial and I don't have the time to defend it right now, but but potentially (laughs) we could have a film or a song or a story Mm. where a certain element of it even kind of fails morally Mm. so long as the overarching work doesn't promote kind of this immoral uh, life right um we could quibble about certain aspects of it and still at the end of the day come to the conclusion this is good art Mm. um because of these other factors that we're taking into account so so it's not to say that art gets reduced to morality right um but that morality is part of the aesthetic judgment and that's what chesterton was trying to argue for that's brilliant yeah i i think seeing the the cooperation of morality and aesthetics working together and the way you've explained that should set the record straight for a lot of people and it gets me thinking too that um the most profound example that we could have uh poor poorly executed art as you said, but have a, a message that we can still appreciate there. But of course, we can we can take issue with the fact that it was poorly executed art. Yeah, that it's and bad art. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I, I love it. I mean, it, 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 this clarified so much for me, and I, I hope it did for uh, our listeners, people on Facebook and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, I uh, think we're out of time, but um, I'd like to have you on the show again as a, uh, you I would know, love to. you're just around the corner anyway. So yeah. Uh, be good to have you back on to talk about this or something else that you're you're passionate about um, bringing on Mythic Mission. And I want to thank you again for your time and I look forward to having you on uh, the show again in the future. Thank you. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. All right. And uh, for those of you that uh, don't know, um, I'm going to put in the show notes, uh, not only uh, more about uh, Professor Benitez, but also where you can learn more about what he's uh, written, what he's writing, what he's working on a link to his podcast, the signature uh, art, or it's just the signature, the signature of man, of man. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the signature of man podcast. And uh, all that will be in the YouTube notes and in the show notes, wherever you're listening to this. And I uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode. We'll see you next time on mythic mission.